Well, hey everyone, my name is Brady. Thank you for joining Tomoka Christian Church today. We're so glad you chose to spend a part of your weekend with us. I'd like to tell you about some great opportunities coming up, so check them out. Tomoka Christian Church is excited to announce the pumpkin patch is now open. So come on out to take some pictures in our maze of pumpkins and enjoy the cool fall weather while also supporting Tomoka's short-term mission teams. The pumpkin patch is open from 3 to 7 p.m. on weekdays and 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. on weekends. For more information, visit tomoka.cc slash events. Treat Street is less than two weeks away and we can't wait to kick off this fun-filled evening. Put on your costumes and bring the whole family out for a drive through Trunks for Treats experience that features candy, music, and lots of entertainment. Treat Street takes place at 7 p.m. on Friday, October 30th in Ormond, and Trunks for Treats is happening at the same exact time in Palm Bay. Learn more and sign up to serve during either event at tomoka.cc slash treatstreet. Are you ready to accept Jesus? Made New Sunday is happening this week and across all three campuses. If you'd like to commit your life to Christ, we invite you to be part of this event. Visit tomoka.cc slash I have decided and you can learn more about what it means to make this important decision as well as register to be baptized. We look forward to seeing you there. Well, that's it for now. Thank you so much for joining us today. Let's get started with the service. HIV AIDS is destroying many lives. Today, millions of people are affected by this disease. Every day, people die and leave their children behind. All the children are left caring for their sick parents. These children live in poverty, do not have enough to eat, have no access to medical care, and can miss years of their education. Seven years ago, Rose joined the Christop program. She has lost both her mother and father. As an orphan, she now lives with her grandmother. Christ Hope selects children into their program who are affected by HIV AIDS and are most needy and vulnerable. We bring hope to Rose's life and their lives of other children and their families. Once in program, children like Rose can remain in family and not be isolated or placed in an orphanage. Christ Hope provides for the child's educational needs, including school uniforms, school fees, and other school materials. The Ministry Care Point is where Christ Hope runs their program. Here, children come multiple times a week to receive the care and support they need. Through Christ Hope, the lives of many children are restored. We are breaking the cycle of HIV AIDS, poverty and spiritual brokenness. has now known the word of God deeply and she's living a life that is upright before God. Number 10. How's everybody doing? All right. 
Hey, scoot on up here so everybody can see you. All right, let me see it. Show of hands. Who's got Georgia tonight? Who's got Alabama? Who cares? All right. Thought I'd try it. Hey, big welcome to everybody who's online. We're so glad you guys chose to make this service a part of your week. Big hello to everybody who's here, man. Listen, I say this, I said it last week, it's true every week. Our team has worked hard, they've prayed. Uh, We expect God to do amazing things uh, here in this space and for those of you online. So uh, we can't wait for you guys to be a part of the service. I just wanna take a minute to introduce a couple groups to you. To my right is a team uh, led by Joe Pudding and several other folks and they're headed to Egypt. They'll be leaving on Monday morning and they'll be serving our 400 churches in Egypt Egypt while they're gone, so I want you guys to give them a hand. I am going to say this. Listen, this is something you can pray for, those of you that can pray online. Uh, the, the airlines require a negative COVID test 72 hours before flight. All tests have been taken. The results have not, have not been returned yet. So we're gonna ask you as a church and for those of you online are a part of this to pray for those 15 negative tests so all of these smiling people can make it to Egypt, all right? Everybody good with that? Trish, everybody raise your hand, Trish, there you go. So Trish Porter is here representing a, a mission trip through our Palm Bay campus. They're headed to Anchor Ridge. Um, we've got a team that we, that we had last week. They're leaving tomorrow. Trish and her, guy, her folks are leaving on Monday, November the 9th, and they'll be serving up at Anchor Ridge. So we're gonna pray for her and her team tonight. And then as you saw in the video, uh, Christ Hope International is here. This is Denny Bear. Denny is the president of the board of directors for Christ Hope International. Um, this is our, uh, our good buddy, Dave Case. Dave is the director of Christ Hope International. And down at the end, who told me not to introduce him, this is Jim Moore. He is the official representative of Christ Hope International. So they're here this week. I want you guys to give them a hand. They're gonna be here, they're gonna be here all weekend. We've got, here in the Ormond campus, we have a table uh, set up. Uh, They're represented at our other campuses too. Listen, they're here for one specific purpose, and that is to see that we get 57 57 children in a community that I've been blessed and fortunate to, to, to go to and witness. 57 of these children that are either affected or infected by the AIDS virus. Your contribution of 40 bucks a month allows them to be fed, to be taught, and more importantly, they, need, they get to be shown the love of Jesus on a day-to-day basis. And so you're gonna get a chance to do that uh, all weekend. And so we're praying that our church, this community, across all of our campuses, sponsors all 57 of those children. So let's pray. Church, why don't you just raise up your hands here toward the stage. Those of you online, just do the same. Father, thank you. Uh, Thank you for Jesus. Um, These people wouldn't be on the stage representing Egypt and North Carolina and the continent of Africa if it wasn't for the hope that we believe exists through the blood of your son. And so, Lord, we just pray together collectively for 15 negative tests for this group so they can travel to Egypt, that they can serve Safal and Mona and all of those churches uh, that you've seen fit to grow up into that country. We pray for Tricia and her team as they head to Anchor Ridge, Father, to do the work that you've prepared them to do. Uh, We pray that you'll bless the final preparations of their trip. And we pray for Christ Hope International, the work that they're doing across the continent uh, with so many of these children that are affected or infected by the AIDS virus. Lord, we pray right now that you would put your gracious hand upon this church and that 57 of those 50 children would find sponsorship through this community of faith. And Father, most of all, may our worship today, may our worship today be such that you're glorified and honored. May you continue to keep your promise. When we lift the name of Jesus, you'll draw all men to you. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. I want you guys to give them a hand. Never far away 
But some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and worship the gold statue when they hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments. That decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing fire. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and ordered that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that he, his face became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. And because the king, in his anger, had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. But suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, Didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw that the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their head was singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted in him. They defiled the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any god except their own.
that is Jesus He who was and still is and will be through it all Oh 
I'd like to take a very quick informal poll uh, this evening. If you would, if by show of hands, can you raise your hand if 2020 is going well for you? Just, uh, okay. I assume if you do, you uh, either own Amazon or a mask factory or something. But I'd say for the rest of us, 2020 has been a little rough. Um, I am a Volusia County Schools public school teacher. Uh, yeah, woo! <laughs> I teach 10th and 11th grade English, in case you're wondering how 2020 is going for me. Uh, it's been incredibly hard, and everyone around me seems incredibly stressed and weighed down with personal things and professional things, and, and you know, I felt this weight over the last few weeks, you know, and just these burdens of this year and everything that's gone on. And I felt like God was just speaking through all of that into my soul and saying, Leah, if I sent Jesus to rescue you and to make you right with me, what more could I ever offer you? And I realized that the goodness of God is not contingent on my circumstances. The goodness of God was sealed a long time ago on a cross. And that if the God of the universe chose to send his son to make up for all of my wrong and all of my hurt and all of my mistakes and literally the worst that I could offer him and for some reason to put my name in the book of life that is in heaven so that I would not die, but that I would spend eternity with the God who made me. How could my life not be a testament to his goodness? And I, I think sometimes we look at this year and we look at God and we say, God, what are you doing? Can, can you see us? You see us down here? You see what's happening? And I feel like we need, we don't need hope. We don't need encouragement. Maybe today we need communion to be a reality check for our souls. That if Jesus came and Jesus died and made us right and rescued us and redeemed us, then God is good. And I realized this week that if God never answers another prayer of my life, and that every year of my life is 2020 on repeat, which I really hope it's not, but if it is, God was good then, and he's good today, and if Jesus is enough for the rest of my days, then God is good forever. And David said, in a very, one of his most famous songs in scripture, he said, taste and see that the Lord is good. And maybe today we need communion. We need this little reminder, these little symbols of Jesus' sacrifice for us to be a literal taste for us, a little reminder that guess what? If your marriage is falling apart, God is still good because Jesus is enough. If you are raising your grandkids, God is still good because Jesus is enough. If you are struggling with addiction, if you are struggling with grown adults or grown kids, if your mental health or your physical health is falling apart, God is still good. And so today I hope that as we, we take these symbols, these reminders of Jesus, that you would be reminded of the cross, that you would be reminded of the love of God that covers every circumstance that the rest of your days will ever see. And that if Jesus is enough, our lives can testify to the goodness of God. So would you join me in taking communion? Would you taste and see that God is good? God, today we, we come before you with grateful hearts. 
God, with heavy hearts that are painfully aware of the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. God, we claim victory over this world. We claim victory over circumstance. We, we claim victory over this world and this life, God, because we know that you bought us, that you gave the sacrifice in Jesus for us for every day and everything that would come. God, no matter where we are right now in this year, where we are in our life, God, we stand and we testify that your goodness is enough for 2020 and 2020, 2021, and every year that comes after this, God, that you have covered our hearts and our souls with your goodness. And we thank you for that this evening. In Jesus' name, amen.
right, everybody. We're ready to get into the Word. We're so glad that you're here. Those of you that are watching online around the world, we're glad you're there as well. Uh, Get your Bibles out to Colossians chapter 2, a little book that Paul wrote to a church in the middle of central Turkey. And what we know about them is that they live to get the gospel to the far ends of the world. Paul gives them credit all throughout the book for their continued, continued Outreach, And so I want to say thank you to you guys for doing just that. The golf tournament today for our mission in Mexico raised about $32,000. So not bad for a day of golf, huh? Uh, so again, that, uh, that's sharing the gospel in about five different churches. That's 100 children that are getting fed. There's a whole bunch of things going on. Now, what I'm going to do next is manipulate you. Now, I'm not sure if it counts as manipulation if I tell you in advance that I'm manipulating you, but I'm, gonna, I'm just telling you that, all right? Some would call it conviction, but I'm just going to call it really what it is. But the truth is, we're not forced to face reality very often, all right? So if you don't want to be manipulated, just close your eyes for about, I don't know, a minute and a half, and I'll, you know... You'll hear, the, you'll hear the groaning, and you'll know when it's time to open your eyes again. In 1973, there was a huge famine in Africa. It, it was uh, water, food, um, children were dying by the millions. And National Geographic sent a team over, you've probably seen the photo before, but they sent a team over and the photographer took this photo of a young boy, I think he was four or five years old, and he was dying, and there's a vulture behind him. Now, the guy won lots of awards, actually, for the photo, but he never knew about it. The photographer took his own life a week after he took this picture. And I often wondered this when I thought about that photographer. Did he, was he not able to handle it? Did he make the decision to take his life because of what he saw? or because of what he didn't do that day when he had the chance. This is what Africa looks like today. When we're talking about the kids in Namibia, this is what we're talking about. I want you to see it. If I'm manipulating you, okay, you can take the picture down. Those of you that didn't want to be manipulated, the picture's off. Uh, It's $38, $40 a month. We need 57. Tomoka needs to come up with 57 sponsors. I know you guys already sponsor lots of kids. Some of you don't do any. Some of you could take all 57 of them. We need to get those done. That's all I'm going to say. You do get a free t-shirt that looks like this. I feel like that little kid on the Shriners giving you a blanket. Uh, But there's a cool shirt that you get just for sponsoring a child. But listen, if your heart doesn't break for that picture, then there's probably something wrong with you. Okay. So let's get to work. One of the memories of my childhood, um, there were, those of you that are younger, you don't know this kind of stuff, but everything was a big deal because there weren't many deals. So everything we got to do was a big deal. Am I right, old people? And one of the big deals was going to a donut shop. Now you can look at me and tell you that I like donut shops. And we would go in and they would have these donuts that were covered in icing and they were filled with raspberry jelly. Life does not get much better than that donut. Am I right? All right. Now, Krispy Kreme's got a pretty good one, but the old-fashioned guys that used to make them. But this used to mess me up. All right. I'm a kid. I'm smart. So I learned what a dozen was. So we go to the donut shop and my dad starts talking about a baker's dozen, right? 13, right? It's a baker's dozen. But I, you know, so this is messing with my little brain, right? You can't do that. Well, so this week, Luann and I decided that we would start raising bees, that we wanted to have our own honey farm. (laughs) Let, Let me get there. Let me get there. So... So we went to the bee farmer and I said, look, I don't know anything about this, but I, I, I'm tired of buying honey and I want to I wanna, you know, just start raising my own. And I said, I'd like to buy 12 bees. I thought that would be a good place to start. So I got home and there were 13 bees. So I called the guy back and I said, hey, I only paid you for 12 and I got 13. And he said, that's a freebie. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, which way would you like to be manipulated? I can go either, which, either way you want. All right, let's get serious. The book of Colossians, we've been talking about what made this church strong was their commitment to the Word of God and their unswerving commitment to the deity of Jesus Christ, that there was one God, that Jesus was God in the flesh, that he had died for them and paid the price. And here's the word Paul writes, if you'll stand. Chapter 2, beginning in verse 6. Again, there's enough meat in this to fill you up for about a month. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives, continue to live your lives rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of God lives in bodily form. And in Jesus Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed with human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, that old man was put away, having been buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities and all the evil in the spiritual realms, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You can be seated. All right, so how do we remain strong? How do we stay faithful to God? Because right now, if I were to ask in the city of Ormond Beach, let's just use this city, I would guess probably 85 to 90% of the people in this city would say they are Christians. Based on the numbers in church, 10% are actually there. So there's a disconnect of about 70%. How long could you live if you didn't eat or get any water? If 70% of the people here didn't get any nourishment, what would happen? You would die. And there's a lot of people that think they're living, they think they're fine, they think they're Christians, but they're doing nothing. They're not connected, they're not worshiping, they're not serving, they're not giving. And he said, as you first heard the gospel, be rooted. Don't miss that phrase. I don't know if you've ever been out to California, one of the great of all the places I've gotten to go, and it's sad that it's in California, but that's where God put them. Uh, But these great trees that are still out there, they covered the planet at one time. They're still scattered out, but here's what the redwoods look like. And if you've not seen them, there are no words. There are no words to describe what a redwood tree is like or a sequoia. They're they're at a level that there's nothing to compare it with. So what, what do you do with it? But let me tell you the key to these trees, 300 and something feet tall, huge things. You can drive cars through the middle of them. They've been standing there for 2,000 years. You know why? Because their roots go way down. But not only do their roots go down as far as the tree is high, all these redwoods have all grown together their roots. They all interlock underneath the ground. So when a fire comes, when wind comes, when a storm comes, you're going to have to take down the entire redwood forest because they're all holding each other up. Does that sound like a picture of the church to you? He said, be rooted. Well, I tried to, I I was a Christian and then I went through a hard time and I guess God just doesn't love me. You don't have any roots. You think because you're Christian, you're not going to have hard times? You think because you're Christian, you're not going to have marriage problems? Now, I understand you've been lied to by pastors. I do understand that. But the truth is, when you become a Christian, you get a bullseye put on you. So you can expect more persecution, more problems. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, he said, if you follow me, you will be persecuted. He said, in fact, if you're not persecuted, you're not living it right. 
If you're, if you're not upsetting somebody because of your faith, not because you're rude, but because of your faith, then you're not living it out right because Jesus said, if they hated me, they're surely going to hate you. You survive, whether it's persecution, whether it's struggles with finances, struggles with your job, family, marriage, alcohol, whatever it is, you overcome it because of the roots, not because of what's up here. You see, the leaves, the fruit that's up there, all that happens because of what's underground. And the truth is, a lot of Christians don't have much underground. And if you're not in the Word, and you're not praying, and you're not serving, and you're not connecting with other people, and you don't have the root structure, Jesus said, when the wind comes, you will simply be blown away. And we live in an era where a whole lot of Christians have, that's exactly what's happened. The people have simply been blown away, grown up in the church, know better, know they need to be following Jesus, but because they've not put down roots, they came to church, they did church, they could still do church. Some of them are still in church now. Some of you are watching online. But if the roots aren't there, when the storms come, and they will come, you won't be able to stand. So Paul writes to a church who's doing everything right and said, guys, just like you've been doing, make sure the roots keep going down and make sure the roots keep growing underneath so you guys hold on to each other and support each other so that the church continues to be strong and faithful. Jeremiah 17, 7, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. So it didn't say bad times didn't come to that tree, did it? Bad times still come to the tree. But because of the root system, the tree is able to stand. Psalm chapter, the first Psalm is maybe the greatest passage on this topic. He says, it says, the person who is is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields fruit in seasons, whose leaf never withers, whatever they do prospers. Because of the root system, not because it doesn't still rain, not because there's not still lightning, not because there's still not hurricanes, not because there's, there's still not pandemics that go on, but the root system is what keeps the tree strong. Paul says to the church, to the individual Christians, be rooted, be invested, be entangled with other people. And listen to me, being entangled in the church, the church is a messy, messy place. And if you've been lied to, and you're, you think you're one of the clean people, well, you, you don't know the truth there either. But the reason a lot of people don't, aren't interested in Jesus is because they think we've got it all figured out. When they find out that we've got dirt on our roots, they're a little more willing to hear about our God. I'm not suggesting we go out and sin. I'm suggesting we be honest with people. Hey, listen, there's nothing special about me. I just found the God who is special, who gave his life for me. Then Paul says, now this one is, is going to get rough, so just, just buckle in. In the second section, he said, you need to be sure that you avoid what will entangle you. Avoid captivity. It's an interesting word. Avoid being enslaved. Now, if you want to enslave somebody, let me, let me tell you how this works. It starts with the mind, and then it moves to the heart, and then the heart determines what the body does. I don't mean the physical heart, but you, your mind has an idea, then your spirit says, that's a good idea or that's a bad idea, and then your body goes and acts on what you've decided to do. And he said, be very careful that you don't get enslaved. Who's he writing to? Church. He's writing to the church. He said, be careful that you do not be taken captive to hollow and vain philosophy. Now, that meant something in Paul's day, but in today's world, I'll just make it real clear to you, okay? When you look at how the world thinks, this is, this is almost a given. You watch what the world says on a topic, you take the opposite side. Because that's the Christian side. Not always. 
But I love what the old preachers used to say. They said, we get up every morning and read the newspaper and the Bible so we get both sides. That's the truth. And the vain philosophies, according to Romans chapter 1, are going to become more and more out of control the closer we get to the end of time. And what are those vain philosophies? Well, they're driving things like Darwinism, the whole evolution concept, abortion, euthanasia. All that's being driven by a godless culture. And Franklin Graham said it as clearly as you can say it this week. You want to know why America's not being blessed? He said, my friends, God cannot bless a nation that slaughters unborn children. That's just as straight as you can put it. He said, you can beg God all day. You can beg God all day for him to bless and bless and bless. But until you repent and say, this cannot happen, you can't expect God to bless the nation. That's just simply put. In fact, I don't even remember the state. I didn't even want to write it down because I... There's a, a kid that died, it happens every week, but a child died in the car, and it's always tragic. But this kid died in the car, you can Google it, because the dad didn't want to hurt his new car. And so there were people there going to break the window, and dad would not let them break the window because it was his new car. Let me help you understand something, okay? I'm sure he regrets the decision now. But that's what happens when you live in a culture where you can't decide what life really matters. When, when you have to stop and think about your car window versus your child, there's something really, really wrong with your culture. Only Jesus can turn that around, folks. He warns the church not to be held captive by these vain philosophies because once you give in, as the old saying goes, it's a slippery slope. When, whatever topic of sin you're talking about, once you start down the road, it never ends. In fact, my question is, where does it end? Where does it end? Total anarchy? We burn down the whole country? We burn down ourselves? What is the end game? Well, you know, Satan told us what the end game was, kill, steal, and destroy. So the answer is yes. Satan's plan is to destroy everything. That's John 8, 44 and 45, if you want to check me out. Jesus said, I came to bring life, and that life more abundantly. That's also in John 8. That's, that's free. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, Paul said, speaking about the demonic world working around us, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. What he warned the Colossians, he said, don't be taken captive. He tells the Corinthians, you take yourself, you become captive to Christ and his plan and what he wants for your life, and then you won't be taken captive by the world philosophy. You put your roots down and you be very careful to guard yourself against all this other stuff that's going on around you. And if you'll just watch the world, you'll almost always know what decision Jesus would make. And then he says, Kingdom principles are always different than the world's principles. When you read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, this what we call the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus was not on a horse, he was on the side of a mountain. 50% uh, of Christians don't know that, so that's why I throw that in there. Uh, they really think that he was riding a horse, that's why there was, anyway, that's, just trying to educate you, that's all. Um, but when you read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it like goes against everything you've ever been taught by the world. Well, what do you do if somebody hits you on the cheek? Well, you turn the other cheek. What do you do if somebody says go a mile? Well, you go two miles. You, you go the extra mile. What do you do if you're persecuted? You bless them in return. And I'm not very good at any of that. But those are kingdom principles. And then in Galatians 5, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Dang it, not very good at that list either. But God's principles are not the world's principles. And sadly, too many Christians are still chasing after the world principles, and then we wonder why we don't have the root system that we ought to have, and it's because we've been chasing after all the wrong things. And some of you are here tonight, and you're chasing. 
You're chasing it sexually. You're chasing it through drugs. You're chasing it through greed. And you wonder, you want your life changed? Feed a kid. Go serve a kid. Go help a neighbor. That's the kind of stuff. But we've been taught in our culture, give me, give me, give me, give me. And eventually, eventually I'm going to get just the right give me and everything's going to be good. The truth is, eventually you die and you leave it all behind. The question is, what do you do with your life? You put down roots, you have your spiritual antenna up so that you know what is right and what is wrong, what to stay away from so that you don't become enslaved and pulled away from Christ and you understand that Jesus' rules are always different than the world's rules. And I'm not trying to make the world happy. I, I, I like somebody, I don't know who wrote this, but the, the comment was so good. They said, you want to be laughed at now or you want to be laughed at in eternity? That's pretty easy for me. I hope it's easy for you. Now, here's the good news. When you read the end of that, that I, what I read, that he took all of our sin, he canceled all of the debt. How did he do it? Nailing it to the cross. It seems pretty, doesn't it? Like you used to kind of see a little tack hammer and... No, it was a gruesome picture of God in the flesh taking nails into his wrist and into his legs and he died on a cross, blood going everywhere to pay the price for our sin. And he said he canceled it. Everything you owe, every debt, everything you owe because of your sin, all the hell that you and I deserve, canceled, paid for on the cross. He said, that's why you put down roots, you avoid enslavement, and you follow the kingdom principles because he paid the bill. Now, if you need to accept Jesus, you're watching online, there's a button. I've decided you can push that button. Come over here. There's the sign that says decision. This is uh, the weekend where we do baptisms at the beach, 6 o'clock tomorrow at Andy Romano. Palm Bay and Land will be having their own. But if you've not been baptized, you need to surrender to Christ. You saw all that right in there. He said when you're baptized into Christ, that he transfers the, the love of God onto our lives and our debt is paid in full. First John chapter 2. You want to know how the kingdom principles work? Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the, prideful, the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires will pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. About as simple as we can put it, isn't it? All right, my God moment. All right. This is a picture of an elephant, which is a designed marvel all by himself. If you can't figure out that that animal did not create itself, there is something truly wrong with you to understand how an elephant works, how his heart works, how his lungs work, the fact that his trunk takes care of everything. Check this out, okay? You and I have a few hundred sensory things going on in our nose and our mouth. You can taste heat, you can taste sweet, you can smell certain smells. Take a guess on the elephant. 50,000. 50,000 sensors inside just at the very end of the elephant's trunk, 50,000 sensors to sort out feeling, um, heat, light, smell, taste. Evolution's amazing. <laughs> 50,000 sensors just at the end of the elephant's nose. You talk about a God who's designed us well. And what it, why did he design the elephant so you and I would go, wow, wow, what a God, what a God. And instead, we live in a culture that says, wow, what an elephant. Yeah, it is a great elephant, but what a God to put that together. I'll finish. I'll finish with this. All right. These stories seem to be happening more and more. I understand the millennials and then what's next, zero, X, K, 
What, what, I don't know what becomes, what, well, what are you, Rachel? Z? Are you a Z? You don't know what you are. See, that's, that's part of the problem right there. That's exactly part of the problem. But more, <laughs> I did not call you a snowflake. That was a random person. I don't know who said that. Um, but they seem to have problems because they want to take selfies with things like buffaloes uh, on the side of Grand Canyon, and it almost never ends well. Uh, a lady recently broke into Yellowstone. Yellowstone was closed. She broke in and was taking a selfie in front of one of the geysers. Now, the geysers are, what, 180-degree water? But she didn't make it. She didn't make it. And I think there's a lot of people that really think, how bad could hell be? You don't want to find out. Jesus came and took all of your debt to the cross if you'll simply accept what he did and then put down roots and hold on. Father, I pray that tonight we would grab a hold of this. Whoever needs to be saved, whether they're watching somewhere around the world, at home, whether they're sitting here in front of me, that they would grab a hold of what you're offering, the forgiveness of sin. For others who have just been coasting, it's time to put down roots. And God, I do know, I know there are people that would be a stretch to sponsor a child. I also know there's people here that could take a whole village, and I know people that have done that. I guess the question is, at the end of our lives, what do we want to be known for? So, Father, tonight we set the roots, and we pray that you take them deep. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. If you'll have a seat just for a minute, I, uh, I rarely quote Star Wars, but my daughter and I went to see Empire Strikes Back. Uh, I know it's an old movie, but that's what they were showing. And uh, there's a moment when Yoda says, you have to do what can't be done. And I thought, if ever there was a statement for the church, because that's what we've been doing for 2,000 years, doing what can't be done. So just a couple things to remind you about our Trunks for Treat event we do every year for Halloween. We still need a few trunks and we need hundreds of pounds of candy. So if you can help with that, uh, see them out at the desk. You can drop the candy off anytime during the week. And we talked about the roots. Well, next week is the chance to sign up for to be in a small group, to get your roots growing where they go down and they interconnect in between services on uh, Sunday. Next Sunday will be the opportunity. It's called Group Link, and this is where you just come and you pick a group, you sign up, and you start to put down those roots. All right, I'm going to finish. This is Jesus' half-brother. This is uh, Jude. And Jude wrote this at the end of his letter. To him who was able to keep you from falling... And to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen.